Hello. It's good to be back with you again this week. Daryl and I had a, a refreshing break away last week as we were able to visit with my brother, Melvin in Florida, and with our friends Bob and Ada as well, and, and to visit one of the local churches there. I'm thankful for the time the church has allowed me to be away and appreciate all of their support through the many years that we have been blessed to be together. Today we're looking at the book of 1 John, chapter 3, and the first 10 verses. And let us hear the word of the Lord. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children or the sons and daughters of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we're God's children now. What will we be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Everyone who commits sin is a child of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born of God do not sin, because God's seed abides in them. They cannot sin, because they were born of God. The children of God and the children of the devil are revealed in this way. All who do not know what is right are not from God, nor are those who do not love their brothers and sisters. And may the Lord bless his reading unto our word today. Sin no more. That's a challenge for us today, to sin no more. But first, as we look at the beginning of 1 John chapter 3, we hear that we are the sons and daughters of God. We are the keepers of the flame. We're the ones who are charged with keeping the faith, of sharing God's word, of sharing God's love. Anthropologists have discovered a, a tribe deep in the South American jungles. The most important role within that tribe is to keep the flame going because fire is precious to them and it's very difficult for those folks to recreate it. We take for granted many of the blessings that we have in life. They do not. They count fire as a blessing and there are many blessings in our lives day by day that we sometimes indeed take for granted. Jesus has called us to keep his word alive in this world, to share the good news. Just as his disciples were entrusted with that privilege of sharing the good news, we today are called to keep that good news going, to keep spreading the word, to be the keepers of the fire, the keepers of the flame. There were those before us who were given that charge. And there are those today who are called to continue that. And of course, there will be those in the future who will be called to keep the flame alive. It's a real challenge in some of our churches today to keep that flame alive. It shouldn't be as hard as it seems to be. If we're truly a people of faith, we, we need to really be diligent about keeping that flame alive. 
Matthew 5, verses 13 and 14 tells us, You are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. We must keep going to be the light in the world because there is much darkness in our world. We've got to keep our zeal, keep our salt to be able to inspire others, to help others to cry out unto God, to seek God in their life, to seek forgiveness of their sins, and then to sin no more. Indeed, our passage today cautions us to sin no more. Seems pretty impossible, doesn't it? To sin no more. There's only been one perfect one, and that is Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lived a sinless life and took all of our sins with him to the cross and continues to bear them upon his body and through his blood. Those sins are being bared. And so we need to strive to sin no more so we do not continue to inflict pain upon him. John Wesley writes that the possibility not to sin comes only from being born into the reality of spiritual life in God. Well, when we're born again, when we have the new birth, it brings about inward changes. Your heart changes, your mind changes, your desires change. And that affects all manner of your existence. You're no longer the same. They're completely different. Before your new birth, before you were born again, you didn't have those spiritual senses. We lived under a veil that just clouded our judgment, clouded our thoughts, clouded our ways of doing things. They were unable to truly hear the voice of God or to know what he was commanding us to do. But as we became believers, all that changed. We were able to hear God's voice. We're now able to understand more of his word. Our eyes have been opened, our ears have been unstopped. We're now able to see him who was invisible to us before. So now we're able to obey God and to truly refrain from sin. Our scripture tells us in verses 6 and 9 to be able to refrain from sin is a challenge, but to do so we must abide in him. In our passage, the words, they cannot sin, can be interpreted as either they cannot sin continually where they do not choose to commit sinful acts. Because even in this epistle in 1 John, in the first chapter, beginning at the verse 8, and going through chapter 2 and verse 2, let us hear these words. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Of course we have sin. And so we may need not to deceive ourselves. And if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. But we must confess. And as we confess, we will be forgiven. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Because we remember those words, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And in chapter 2, it says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But catch these words. But if anyone does sin, so we might sin in our lives. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Christ advocates for us when we sin, and we need to rely upon him. Scripture gives us guidance through and through on 
how to overcome sin. In Proverbs 1.10, it says, My son, if sin entices thee, then say no, just say no. You've heard that slogan before, haven't you? Just say no. Sometimes saying no is pretty hard. Sometimes when pressure is put on by friends, family, it's difficult to say no. But it needs to get easier and easier to say no to where it's an automatic response when somebody tries to get you to sin. Enter not into the path of wickedness, and go not into the way of evil men. Also for Proverbs 14. Enter not into the path of the wicked. Just don't go that way. Head a different way. Head the way of righteousness. Ephesians 6 and verse 13 tells us, Take upon ourselves the whole armor of God. And as we do, we'll be able to stand. We'll be able to stand against those fiery darts. We'll be able to stand against those powers of wickedness and darkness. We'll be able to overcome sin in our life. But we must take upon ourselves the whole armor of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 tells us there are temptations that are going to come your way. And those temptations are not going to be something that others have not dealt with. Others have dealt with similar things. But as the temptations come, as the song goes, yield not to temptation. Again, go back to the words of Proverbs. Just say no. As you walk with God, it's important that you continue to walk in faith and say no to sin and sin no more. Not to become what we call backsliders. We're warned again in Proverbs, the 14th chapter, not to be self-absorbed in our own hearts or to be satisfied with our own self. Because as we are, it often will lead you to be in a backslider, which will cause you to sin, obviously. And the challenge for a believer is to try fully to lean upon Jesus and not to sin anymore. Solomon was beguiled and tricked by his wives and enticed to sin. Solomon left God by what we consider some evil associations, by giving in to those who had put pressure on him. We've got to guard ourselves against evil associations, against those that would encourage you to sin, that would encourage you to go the wrong way. Sometimes we get caught up in ourselves, which leads us to sin. We get caught up in our worldly success. Amaziah, after thoroughly defeating the enemy of the Edomites, he got caught up in himself and, and walked away from serving God. There are many others that you've seen throughout biblical history and modern history. Who have walked away from God because they've got caught up in their own success. And we've got to guard against that and make sure that we continue to sin no more. There are lots of examples that we can pull from in the Bible. There have been examples all around you of folks who certainly have walked a, a very faithful life. We have realized that the more they lean upon Jesus, the less likely they are to commit sin. You've seen family members and friends and folks at church that seem to have it all together. But let me assure you, they're not perfect either. As I started out earlier, there's only one who has been perfect, and that is Jesus. And we need to keep our eyes focused upon him. As we keep our eyes focused upon him, it will help us to not sin anymore. God loves you. And he tells us to go 
and sin no more, and to lead others to the salvation of Christ. Today, are there some sins in your life that you need to lay at the altar? Lay those before God and ask for forgiveness, and God will surely forgive you. As long as you truly ask with a truly penitent heart, you will be forgiven. And then try and have the power of God with you to sin no more. Thank you for being with me today. May God bless you and enrich you and fill you with his goodness. May God keep you strong and healthy. May his blessings abide upon you. May he look after you until we meet again. In the name of Christ we ask. Amen.